How's it going, guys? Atherosclerosis and gynocardiomyopathies for U.S. Simile. You're going to choose endothelial cell as the answer for where atherosclerosis starts. So this process of endothelial damage, whether due to non-enzymatic like oscillation of the endothelium by diabetes from the glucose, uh, from hypertension, from smoking, you're going to get movement of monocytes from the blood under the outer surface of the blood vessel, maturation of the macrophages, phagocytosis of oxidized LDL particles, foam cells, and then you're going to get a gradual development of a fatty streak with smooth muscle cell migration, and eventually a plaque can calcify and it can rupture leading to an MI. So diabetes followed by smoking, followed by hypertension, most acceleratory risk factors slash the worst risk factors for atherosclerosis but hypertension is most common overall in the population. And then as I talked about in another presentation, when we talk about the carotid arteries specifically, hypertension is most acceleratory because you have the strong systolic impulse from the, ha from the heart pounding the carotids, causing endothelial damage. So if you have a stroke TIA or retinal artery occlusion in someone with high blood pressure, you want to think that that's carotid stenosis, the plaque that's launched off. But if they tell you the patient, does not have high blood pressure, especially over the age of 70, you want to think atrial fibrillation with the left atrial mural thrombus that's launched off to the brain slash eye. Patients who have long history of hypertension, followed by a very recent history of accelerated hypertension, that's renal artery stenosis, usually on US So they'll, they'll tell you a guy has a 20-year history of hypertension, which is the most common risk factor for atherosclerosis. Well, that's going to occur, the atherosclerosis, everywhere in the body, the coronaries, abdominal aorta, popliteals, renal arteries. Okay, so eventually, after two decades, it reaches a clinical threshold where we now get a surge of the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, and that's causing our accelerated hypertension. Okay, so you had subclinical renal artery stenosis that eventually hit its threshold where we now have the surge of RAS causing it to be clinical. As I mentioned briefly before, you can get calcification of plaques. That can confuse some students. They haven't heard of that, uh, but you just want to know that that can be seen. The calcium score can reflect your degree of uh, maturation of atherosclerotic plaques. A higher score is worse if someone's uh, calcium score is performed. Statins for you, similarly, obviously, they inhibit hmg coa reductase enzyme, but where students can get, can get tripped up is if they tell you a statin is given, ask for its mechanism, and then they, they don't say anything about HMG coli reductase inhibition as the answer is, you're like, what the hell? And then the correct answer is upregulation up of LDL receptors on hepatocytes, because if you knock out that enzyme in the liver, the liver is going to have to compensate uh, because it can't make cholesterol. It's going to pull it out of the blood. Okay, that's why the LDL receptor expression is increased. You want to know the mechanism of action of azetamide, but they ask it straight up on the USMLA. You just want to know that it's a drug that blocks small bowel absorption of cholesterol. Bile acid sequestrants, uh, I don't think I've ever seen them as correct answers. They're always wrong answers, but you learn about them anyway, where if you block bile acid absorp reabsorption in the terminal ileum because you're sequestering it in the small bowel lumen, then the liver has to make more bile acids to compensate. And the way it does that is by converting cholesterol into bile acids. So if it converts cholesterol into new bile acids, it's got to pull more cholesterol out of the blood. Okay, so it's this big, elaborate, fancy mechanism that you assume actually doesn't give a fuck about, but I just mentioned it here. So fibrates, you want to know upregulate PPAR, and they upregulate lipoprotein lipase. That enzyme is going to allow for triglycerides to move from the blood into the adipocyte. That's what lipoprotein lipase is going to do. So fibrates are the number one drug to de decrease triglycerides. I'm not going to go off on a lengthy discussion about proprotein convertase, subtilicin, kexin type 9 or, uh, inhibitors or sacubitril, the, the former being uh, alirocumab, evolocumab, waste of fucking time for USMLA, and, and uh, sacubitril being a neprolyse inhibitor. Uh, but it's, it's a waste of time. The only reason I'm mentioning them here briefly is because some students get emotional, and if I don't bring them up, then I'll start getting DMs about what about these drugs. So... Chest pain, stable angina, okay? I mean, it makes sense. You have predictable degree of exertion. Um, and you're going to start to get pain when there's greater than 70% occlusion of the vessel. ST depressions are what you're going to see on ECG. And nitrates, of course, are used to treat. So they can tell you a sublingual drug was given, what's its mechanism of action, and you need to know the answer is increased CGMP. That's how they'll ask in USMLA. Okay, so you know nitrate's the drug they're talking about. The answer is increased CGMP. Increased CAMP is wrong, for instance. 
And CGMP, okay, it's going to lead to a relaxation of venous smooth muscles, so you're decreasing uh, decreasing venous return to the heart. Okay, so you're, you're increasing venous pooling. By decreasing venous return, you're going to have a decreased oxygen demand in the myocardium. And then nitrates are contraindicated with phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, such as sildenafil, okay, Viagra, uh, because phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors prevent the breakdown of CGMP, but you have nitrates that upregulate the synthesis of CGMP, so you can get hypotension. And then just be aware that cytonitroprusside is technically a nitrate agent, but if they ask you where it acts, choose arterioles over the veins. Okay, it's used for hypertensive emergencies. Now, unstable angina is going to be pain that chest pain that occurs at rest, but it's going to be a patient with severe cardiovascular risk factors, hypertension, diabetes, smoking, unlike Prinzmetal, which I'll talk about in a moment, which will be a young patient without cardiovascular risk factors because that can also occur at rest. SC depressions on ECG mean just general ischemia, but you don't have overt infarction. Diltiazem is a non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker that shows up on a new 2CK form as an agent that's used for unstable angina. You could just be aware of that. And then for whatever reason, US simply wants you to know that cardiac catheterization is done in patients who have acute coronary events being unstable angina or a myocardial infarction. Prinzmetal angina, you need to know it also is known as variant angina pectoris. So for they'll give you a very buzzy presentation of a young healthy patient because it's not due to atherosclerosis, it's vasospasm. So let's say 25 year old dude's watching TV and he gets a sharp chest pain, okay, and, and that's prinzmetal angina and uh, you'll be looking for it as the answer. You don't see it, and that's just variant angina pectoris. It's on one of the NBME exams. They just listed as that. So it's vasospasm, as, as I said, not atherosclerosis. And ST elevations can be seen. So you can give nitrates, which will dilate the coronary arteries. You can give diadropyridine calcium channel blockers, such as nifedipine, which are normally used for hypertension. It can also be used for uh, pulmonary hypertension, which will dilate the coronary arteries. And you want to avoid any agents that will constrict. Okay, so alpha one agonists, alpha one agonists such as mitodrine, oxymetazoline, phenylephrine, you would avoid those. Avoid non-selected beta blockers such as propranolol, because if you block all beta, you're going to have unopposed alpha, mainly alpha one, which will constrict, and we don't want that. If you're weak on farm, okay, you can go to my farm modules. I talk a lot about that stuff. Cardiomyopathies. Okay, so dilated cardiomyopathy can be isolated left ventricular or diffuse four-chamber dilation, and then you have a very buzzy and large cardiac silhouette where you can see it's, it's lateralized. It's most of the width of the chest. And systolic dysfunction, where your ejection fraction is under 55%, is the, char the key characteristic. And you got to know the arrows for step one. Right? Obviously, if you're studying for step two, you should know this as well, but decreased ejection fraction, and then you're going to have increased left ventricular end diastolic volume and pressure. So it's a dilated chamber, and there's more pressure, more fluid there. S3 heart sound, 99% of the time is pathologic. It means increased, in general, it means increased preload, but 99% of the time means systolic dysfunction and pathologic. 1% physiologic uh, and high endurance athletes and pregnancy. So you can get a lateralized apex speed, as we just saw with the, uh, well, actually, lateralized apex speed is physical exam, but you get the dilated cardiac silhouette, as we saw in the chest x ray. Point of maximal impulse rather than being left, left mid clavicular line. Uh, fourth intercostal space is going to be lateralized. They can see anterior axillary or axillary line. And then you should know that the lateralization, very common for DCM vignettes, but it's not pathognomonic. You can see it in other conditions like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which I'll talk about as we go through here. Dilated cardiomyopathy, easy mnemonic to remember what, what causes it. A, B, C, D, alcohol, beriberi, it's thiamine deficiency, so wet beriberi. Dry beriberi is neuropathy. Kaksaki B virus, okay, so Kaksaki B caused dilated carmapathy, diabetes mellitus type 1, pleuridinia, uh, cocaine use, Chagas disease, that's trypanosoma cruzi, American trypanosomiasis. Chagas disease can also cause uh, achalasia and toxic megacolon, drugs, doxorubicin, okay, so you crackles in the lungs, that's three hearts on with, uh, that's drug typically used for Hodgkin, uh, so chemotherapeutic agent. Other causes, peripartum cardiomyopathy. So a woman at the end of pregnancy, severe dyspnea, severe peripheral edema, it's a dilated cardiomyopathy. Hemochromatosis can cause it, as well as rheumatic heart disease, okay? 
So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, don't confuse with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, which I'll also talk about. But hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is due to hypertension. Hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy is your autosomal dominant beta mice and heavy change gene mutation, sudden death in young athletes. Okay, so I'll, I'll talk about that as I just said. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, diastolic dysfunction. So your ejection fraction is preserved. Because we do not have systolic dysfunction, the heart can pump perfectly fine, but your ejection fraction being normal is the hallmark of diastolic dysfunction. Now, where students can, can get tripped up is they say, I don't get it though. If the heart can't expand as well as it should, then why is left ventricular end diastolic, end diastolic volume normal? Shouldn't it be reduced? The answer is you're going to have normal left ventricular end diastolic volume that we can achieve. It merely requires greater pressure to get there. Okay, so we have more pressure to achieve the same left ventricular end diastolic volume, and we have preserved ejection fraction. S4 heart sound means afterload. Stiff left ventricle from afterload, hypertension. You can get it from aortic stenosis as another cause. That's afterload. Whereas S3 and S4 is diastolic dysfunction. Okay. Whereas S3 preload, systolic dysfunction. We're talking like 29 out of 30 times here. Okay. So dialocarmopathy, uh, as said before, lateralized apex beat. You can see it with hypertrophic. And then you want to know some important findings that mean left ventricular hypertrophy, paradoxical splitting of S2, left bundle branch block, uh, left axis deviation on ECG. You don't have to worry about the mechanisms. I'm just telling you, if you get a big 15-line rambling paragraph and they say somewhere in there, there's a left bundle branch block, and you're like, well, I don't know what that means. They say left axis deviation or uh, paradoxical splitting of S2. Any of these findings, you just say, okay, that just means left ventricular hypertrophy. Okay, so you can see those with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in particular. Now, what's my observation, the way they tend to assess HCM is they'll give you a patient who's got extensive hypertensive disease, hyper, hypertensive retinopathy, you okay, can get arterial venous nicking on fundoscopy flame hemorrhages, and narrow uh, sausage shape of the retinal vessels. They can diaper, tell you hypertensive nephropathy, hyperplastic arterial sclerosis, increased creatinine. And what this is what's going to go down. They're going to give you a big paragraph. They're going to give you all these findings. So severe, hypertension 180 over 100, all this stuff about hypertensive retinopathy, hypertensive nephropathy. They say the dude smokes two packs a day. And then they say, which the following would have prevented this patient's presentation? Smoking cessation is wrong. The student's flummoxed slash flabbergasted because that's usually a very high yield buzzy answer and very correct uh, frequently. But if they give you a 15-line paragraph where it's all about hypertensive disease, clearly management of the hypertension is what they're getting at there. So you want to be careful sometimes. Hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, once again, you know, this is our autosomal dominant beta myosin heavy chain gene mutation, causes disordered, disarrayed myocardial fibers, and asymmetric septal-shaped hypertrophy that leads to the anterior mitral valve leaflet, obstructing the left ventricular outflow tract. And the murmur can sound similar to aortic stenosis, which would be mid-systolic. And it's, of course, our sudden death in young athlete. And the cause is ventricular fibrillation. So when we have obstruction of the left ventricular outflow tract, we get acute left heart strain precipitating ventricular fibrillation. VF is also the most common cause of death following an MI because you get necrotic tissue leading to dysarrhythmia or just ar arrhythmia, I should say. Pulmonary embolism, most common cause of death, ventricular fibrillation as well, because you get acute right heart strain, especially with massive saddle embolus. So a key thing, and this is difficult, okay, and I talk about this stuff in my, uh, my PDF on cardio where you can look at that more slowly if you want, but you should know that the way you differentiate Hockham from aortic stenosis is that because they're both mid-systolic murmurs at the aortic location is that Aortic stenosis is going to get worse with more volume in the heart. Hockham's going to get worse with less volume in the heart. So if you do a maneuver such as standing or going from supine to sitting or Valsalva where you're decreasing preload, then that's going to make Hockham worse. And if you're decreasing preload, aortic stenosis would get softer or no change. So if they give you a situa if they give you a situation where uh, they say there's a systolic murmur in an 18-year-old, uh, and he's athletic or whatever, and uh, there's no change with Valsalva, Hockham's fucking wrong. 
Okay, and students like, but he's 18 and he's athletic. It doesn't fucking matter. It's autosomal dominant, bicuspid aortic valve. It can show up in any age. So that's how you differentiate. Okay, and then um, giving you tangential as well with mitral valve prolapse. Hockham and MVP are the two murmurs that get worse with uh, less volume in the heart. All the other murmurs are going to get worse with more volume in the heart. Okay, and then uh, as heart rate increases, there's a fractionally lesser amount of time the of the cardiac cycle spent in diastole. Okay, so as heart rate increases, diastole is shortened more than systole. It's an answer on the NBME you got to know, and that is why in uh, we get sudden death in young athletes is because when their heart rate is very high, e.g. on the soccer field, they have less time spent in diastole. They're going to have less left ventricular end diastolic volume, which leads to greater obstruction of their left ventricular outflow tract. But the reason that you still get maintained slash increased cardiac output with the higher heart rate, despite that lower volume, is because of increased inotropy, where greater contraction, we get a, a lesser uh, left ventricular and systolic volume, so more blood is can be pumped out at the, at the end. So beta blockers are going to slow the heart rate, which will increase the amount of time we spend in diastole, which can allow for greater filling of the heart. Okay, these are lengthy discussions. Uh, so you could ask, well, beta blockers are, aren't they going to increase oxygen demand in the heart if they're increasing preload? The answer is no, because the decreased chronotropy heart rate, the decreased inotropy contractility, is decreased oxygen demand that supersedes the effect of the increased preload. So you just gotta know beta blockers slow the heart rate, they can be used uh, for Hockham. And then restrictive cardiomyopathy, similar to hypertensive cardiomyopathy, is diastolic dysfunction, where we have a preserved ejection fraction. Okay, so so no change ejection fraction, and then likewise, we have a normal left ventricular end diastolic volume. It just requires more pressure to get there. Okay, so JVD is a very buzzy finding you can see with restrictive cardiomyopathy. Of course, JVD is not pathognomonic. I mean, it's it's something you can see in many conditions. I'm just telling you that when you're getting a vignette on this stuff, how is it going to present? There's going to give you someone who does not have an enlarged heart. They have normal ejection fraction. They can have an S4 heart sound, which means diastolic dysfunction, and they'll give you JVD. Okay, and then you're going to look at the demographics. If they don't give you a blood pressure of 180 over 100, less likely to be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And if they tell you there's history of radiation to the chest, e.g., uh, for Hodgkin lymphoma or amyloidosis, such as multiple myeloma, uh, autoimmune diseases, hemochromatosis, restrictive. Now, some students are going to say, but I thought you said that hemochromatosis can be dilated also. So if I get this on the exam, which one is it? The answer is whichever one they fucking give you. If they give you an S3 heart sound, dilated heart, lateralized apex beat, that's going to be dilated cardiomyopathy. If they give you, uh, and, and if the, in, with a reduced ejection fraction with that, uh, DCM, if they give you preserved ejection fraction, S4 heart sound, there is no lateralization of the apex beat. They give you JVD, that's restrictive cardiomyopathy due to hemochromatosis. And then as I just mentioned before, multimyeloma is the highest yield cause of restrictive cardiomyopathy on US simile. Okay, nine out of 10 times. Can be autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, but this image right here, they love. Okay, so the pink, uh, eosinophilic means pink. So the highly eosinophilic, the highly pink areas here are normal myocardium. And then the whiter areas, the more weakly staining eosinophilic areas, that's your protein deposition. So uh, in multi myeloma, you got plasma cells secreting immunoglobulins. Immunoglobulins are proteins. So those are depositing where they shouldn't be depositing, causing diastolic dysfunction. So they'll give you a multi-myeloma patient with S4 heart sound, JVD, okay, and that's in preserved ejection fraction, that's restrictive cardiomyopathy. Okay, so those are some high yield points for you Uh don't really know what to tell you in terms of grouping these three things together. Obviously, I'm gonna continue putting out more content, so subscribe to my channels, and I appreciate your time. That's it.